Hello, welcome to another induction heating the Ambrel Way video. It shows how straightforward induction heating can be when done the Ambrel Way. Today we're going to show how to take your recently delivered Ambrel Easy Heat Inverter and get it ready to heat your components. It would be an insult to your intelligence to explain how to unpack it from the box. So we'll start at the stage where you have the contents of the delivery spread out across the bench and are ready to prove it fulfills the needs of your production process. The biggest item in the shipment is the inverter. This takes your 230 volt main supply and converts it to the high frequency power needed to heat your component. It's a complex mixture of high speed microelectronics and brute force water cooled power. Like any other processor controlled equipment, it can be set up to perform a lot of different and complex functions. However, individual users generally only require small subsets of these functions for their specific requirements. The inverter is connected to your main supply by a length of cable. The connector at one end of the cable fits into the back of the inverter and at the other end to the mains supply. Cables with different mains plugs can be used to power the inverter in different countries. The work head matches the power of the inverter to the precision required by your process. The heating coil connects to this end of the work head and the inverter feeds power into the other end via a flexible cable. Although induction heating is a very efficient way of heating metal, there are still some losses. These are carried away by flowing water through the inverter, workhead and coil. The water is constantly recirculated through either a refrigerative or in this case a compact air blast cooler. The shape of the work coil can be made very specifically to fit your component or just the part of your component that you need to heat. This simple coil, when placed around a component, will heat the narrow band of metal that lies directly inside the coil. Placing a differently shaped coil over the component will produce a different pattern of heat consistent with the shape of that coil. While connecting the parts of the system together, we're going to ensure that we cannot receive an electrical shock by keeping the mains plug disconnected and in clear sight at all times. To remain cool, this coil requires a continuous flow of water through it. To make the magnetic field that heats the metal inside it, it must at the same time have a high electrical current flowing through it. To keep the water contained, the electrical connections between the coil and the blocks on the face of the workhead have rubber o-rings set into a rebate in their surface. As the electrical connection is made by bolting the coil to the mounting blocks, these o-rings make a watertight seal, keeping the water separate from the electricity. Contrary to what I'm sure you've been taught, water and electricity can mix, providing they are handled correctly. In the United States of America, coils are more commonly connected to the workhead using compression fittings comprising nuts and ferrules. Both the cooling water tubes and the electrical feed to the workhead travel in the same sleeve. The water tubes are color coded. The clear tube carries the cold water first to the workhead and then to the coil. The red tube carries the warm water as it returns. The two tubes connect to the appropriately labelled couplings on the back of the inverter. Simply push them firmly into position. Red and clear. When it is necessary to remove one of the tubes, press the locking ring in with a suitable tool, for example, a 7mm flat spanner and pull the tube free. The cold water to cool the inverter is fed first to the semiconductor heatsink and from there out to the workhead and coil. Connect the cold supply of water from the cooler to the inverter heatsink connector. The return water from the inverter to the cooler 
leads via the connector to the left of the workhead connections. Now is a good time to turn the cooler pump on and check for leaks. Of course, as this is a demonstration, there are none. In the same sleeve that carries the water to and from the workhead is the cable that supplies the RF power to the coil. On the end of this cable is a connector which plugs into and then is turned to lock onto the RF outlet on the back of the inverter. The only thing remaining is to plug the connector on the power lead into the socket next to the power switch. Everything is now connected in readiness to turn the inverter on. Adjusting the inverter to operate in the way that you require and produce the power that you need is the subject of another induction heating the Ambrel way video.